This is Tom Fox. Welcome to the newest edition in the Compliance Podcast Network, my latest podcast, Compliance and Coronavirus. As the voice of compliance, I wanted to start a podcast which will help bring both clarity and sanity to the field of compliance, the compliance practitioner, and indeed the compliance profession during this worldwide health and healthcare crisis. Taking up a variety of topics as diverse as working from home to sporting events, to the role of the board of directors, to crisis management, to the role of supply chains. We will look at all of these in this podcast. If you have a topic you'd like covered on compliance and coronavirus, please let me know. I'd be happy to do a podcast on it. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox. In this episode of Compliance and Coronavirus, I'm joined by Eric Feldman, who takes a look at the board's role in leading corporate culture, most especially during the time of coronavirus and as we move into Q3 and Q4, and some of the unique challenges the board faces in corporate governance as well. I know you'll find this a fascinating and useful episode. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox back for another episode. And today I'm extraordinarily pleased to have with me a good friend, Eric Feldman. Eric is Senior Vice President of Affiliated Monitors. Eric, first of all, welcome and thank you so much for taking the time to visit with me today. Thanks for having me, Tom. Eric, it's been my privilege to have you on this podcast a couple of other times earlier in the coronavirus health crisis. And as we have moved forward, uh, literally, or really, I guess from about mid-March up until now, we're recording this in uh, mid-August. We've obviously seen, well, there are my maids, so let me go let them in. <laughs> this conference will now be recorded. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox, back for another episode. And today I have back with me Eric Feldman. Eric is the Senior Vice President at Affiliated Monitors. Eric, first of all, welcome, and thank you for taking the time to visit with me today. Thanks for having me, Tom. Eric, as we have moved from kind of the start of the coronavirus health crisis back in uh, early to mid-March, now into, uh, we're recording this in mid-August, we've obviously seen companies uh, begin to respond, begin to have solutions or at least workarounds. And I was wondering if we might be able to visit on some of the things that you have seen that companies have done to help better position themselves, both from the compliance perspective and the overall corporate governance perspective, and perhaps some things that you've seen companies do poorly. So are there some things that you have seen companies do that uh, you believe have not only responded to the health crisis, but also responded to some of the issues that you and I typically work with around compliance and corporate governance? Oh, sure. You know, it it really has been a fascinating study to watch uh, how different companies approach things differently. And there's a a, a Warren Buffett quote, which is perfectly designed for these times. And that is, uh, only when the tide goes out can you see who's been swimming naked. And that's what Unfortunately, we've seen with those companies that have had, let's say, ethical challenges, culture challenges, uh, they're struggling the most. They're having difficulty uh, with a workforce that w- was hanging on you know, with a thread beforehand. Uh, this has made things incredibly worse. On the other hand, there are those companies that paid attention to the corporate culture that had a strong culture in the first place. And they've been able to, uh, to modify their approaches. They've been able to uh, continue doing business in a remote environment because they already had a strong culture and a strong tie to their workforce. The, the most critical thing that I've seen the companies that have been successful so far in doing this is maintaining that connectivity with their people and demonstrating to the people that their number one concern is people over profit and taking care of their folks and not exposing them unnecessarily to COVID risk. And we've seen through employee surveys and interviews and and focus groups that 
we've been doing all remotely so far, by the way, since March, what we've been seeing is that employees, work for the workforce responds to that level of caring. And we've heard more so than ever, I think, in uh, the work that I've been doing, employees saying, you know, this company really shows it cares about us. And people have been willing to take pay cuts, not that they have a choice, but they've been okay with taking pay cuts, with all of the uncertainty that comes with this time period about losing their jobs. They've handled it. They've managed it and stayed productive because they think the company cares about them. That's one of the big lessons learned. Eric, the uh, the thing I absolutely agree with your uh, remarks that this has been a fascinating study, but one of my observations has been that some of the trends that we saw percolating in 2018, 2019, uh, that were in the ethosphere around compliance have accelerated and accelerated at the speed of light. But listening to you, I almost hear you saying that trends that companies had have accelerated as well within within the company. And you pointed, obviously, to the corporate communications and corporate culture, and that if you had a robust culture, including communications with employees, that you were able to utilize that and, and really expand that out to workers who are now working remotely. Uh, would you find that a, a type of analysis valid? Oh, it's absolutely valid. Uh, there's one company that we're dealing with that um, had recently changed their human resources uh, uh, structure uh, to an organization that they call People and Culture. And they did this before COVID. And this People and Culture organization immediately mobilized uh, when COVID hit to ensure that every response the company made to COVID, whether it was a technological response, a control response, um, a financial response, that it was done in the context of how it was going to affect our people. And in doing it, everything was much more effective. Um, likewise, there, there are other companies that we've seen uh, that were culture challenged from the very beginning, before this happened. And their approach uh, was a lot more draconian to cutting people, cutting jobs, cutting uh, salaries without the requisite communication. So people understood that they were being, this is a part of a longer term solution and our leadership knows what they're doing to get us through this period. They didn't, have that level of communication. Uh, and when you don't have that, and by communication, I don't mean email, uh, because that's, you know, the easy way out and not an effective way out. Um, personal communication is what has been necessary to get workforces through this situation. Now, you're a company of 40 or 50,000 people. You're not going to have the CEO talking to everyone individually, but through a cascading process where the CEO demands of his subordinate supervisors and managers that they connect with their teams in a personal way makes all the difference in the world. Eric, if I could change the focus to corporate governance and ask you about of boards of directors at this point in time has or have you seen the coronavirus health crisis put more pressure on boards not only to um, be more involved in both tone at the top and culture but also around risk risk management and overseeing risk as an appropriate board function um, I have uh, I have seen that I've seen the board becoming much more involved in those companies that, um, you know, that have independent boards. Um, I, I think that 
boards are finding that their audit committees, uh, who are often responsible for ethics and compliance as a as a function, um, don't have enough bandwidth to deal with all of the issues that are coming up regarding other kinds of risk other than financial risk. And I've seen a few companies actually during this period create corporate governance committees. And one, in fact, created a uh, an ethics and compliance committee of the board separate and apart from the audit committee to specifically focus on how we're maintaining the culture of the organization and our ethics and compliance posture through this challenging time. Uh, the, the problem the board has from a risk perspective is uh, balancing the absolutely necessary focus on are we going to get through this financially uh, versus what we have to do to maintain our workforce to ensure that when we do come out the other end, we have a workforce to maintain and whether we lose people or not. Uh, and, you know, the board has really, in some organizations, stepped up its game and taken on a lot more leadership, uh, giving renewed meaning, I think, to the term tone at the top. Eric, if I could change the focus just a little bit, um, in uh, FCPA enforcement actions, typically third parties are involved, and typically those third parties are on the uh, sales side of things. But I was wondering if you are seeing a greater emphasis now on third parties in the supply chain from the compliance perspective during this time frame. Absolutely. That's a great question, Tom. And and. You know, what we have seen is that uh, there has been significant disruption in the supply chain uh, for many companies. And, you know, that is because some pieces of the supply chain have, frankly, gone out of business. Uh, others can't deliver because of um, problems with their own uh, raw materials, d- delivery, shipments. And others have changed focus to providing necessary resources to address uh, the pandemic. And so companies are having to find new contractors, new third parties, new suppliers. Um, The question is, to what extent are they applying uh, the same level of due diligence as they did before? Or are they, because of the, uh, the time imperative, rushing through new suppliers uh, just to keep the doors open. And we've seen a little bit of both where normal controls and due diligence over third parties um, have been uh, sidestepped in order to expedite getting suppliers on board. And that ultimately is going to create problems down the road for companies. Eric, if I can end with going in yet another direction, uh, you are a uh, CPA by uh, professional background, I believe, uh, obviously been an inspector general. So I was wondering if I might turn for a couple of thoughts from you around fraud, potential for fraud in an organization, the applicability of the fraud triangle uh, during this time frame, and why companies may need to be even more vigilant around employee fraud, in addition to some of the other topics we've talked about? Uh, Sure. And, you know, Tom, I've I've been using the fraud triangle more than I have in in probably decades um, to illustrate to organizations the risks that they're facing right now. So to kind of review real quickly, the fraud triangle consists of three elements, opportunity, rationalization, and pressure. Opportunity has been created, more opportunity for employees to commit fraud in organizations because of remote work. The traditional oversight mechanisms that have existed in organizations, and not just cybersecurity, but uh, you know, every aspect of 
uh, even finance to a certain extent, a lot of those oversight mechanisms aren't there or there's a perception that they're not there. And employees believe, may believe that they have an opportunity to do things uh, from a fraud perspective that they didn't have before. Rationalization is really at its peak right now because there are employees whose salaries have been cut, whose uh, jobs are uncertain, and they rationalize, well, you know, we're in a pandemic, um, you know, I'm making less money, uh, maybe I'm going to be fired down the road because we're reducing um, uh, people because the company is not performing. Uh, I'm going to take what I deserve. I've given years to this company. I put in time. I'm going to take what I deserve. I rationalize that me committing fraud at this point is okay. And then the pressure that is occurring, the, the pressure on employees is enormous. Not just the personal pressure. When you think about how many employees are dealing with financial issues and education issues, dealing with, with kids and sending them to school and homeschooling, family issues, health issues, uh, pressures are enormous. At the same time, there's pressure about losing their job. There's pressure about how do I perform in this remote environment? How do I demonstrate that I'm performing? Uh, there, there's a lot of pressure. And I don't know about you, but for me, remote work um, is harder. Remote work creates more time. It's very uh, difficult for a lot of people to turn that computer off. And you're, you're probably reviewing emails seven days a week, 12 to 15 hours a day. And we're seeing a lot of that in the workforce that's creating pressure. Uh, ACFE did a study, um, a benchmarking study on uh, COVID, and they found significant numbers of uh, companies ha predicted at the beginning of the pandemic that there'd be more fraud, occupational fraud in organizations, and that's bearing out. There has been more fraud, not just in uh, some of the assistance programs like the payroll protection program and other parts of the stimulus, but occupational fraud. Um, there's a huge risk, and companies need to pay attention to that now. Eric, it sounds like uh, we are really hitting all three uh, sides of the fraud triangle in a way that uh, perhaps we haven't hit before. At least, I, I guess I'm seeing they're all, all almost equal in this time frame. Um, and so companies need to respond with a variety of fraud prevention uh, tactics, both in terms of prevention and detection. Would that also be something you might advise? Absolutely. Uh, you know, with the uh, the additional uh, computer and software resources that come with working in a remote environment, there's also additional uh, monitoring and data collection resources that are available remotely uh, to be doing data mining um, up front to understand if there are anomalies that could indicate possible fraud in the organization. So prevention is key. Detection is, is critical as well to understand if there are fraud schemes going on to detect them and to stop them. Um, and then there's the challenge of responding to those. How do you respond to fraud and do a complete investigation in a remote environment, if it is not practical to go and interview people face to face. And I've heard investigators tell me that it just is not the same, um, that they're really unable to get the same level of uh, insight into someone that they're interviewing uh, via Zoom rather than being in person, body language. Um, and, and other factors of being in a room that there really is no substitute for that. So I, I do think that we've got an enormous amount of work to do. Eric, once, been, once uh, again, drawing upon your professional background, 
Um, one of the things that has interested me is to pick up on your last point. There may be some of the strategies, tools, and even techniques previously used in an investigation that are not open to us now. But that means either there is an opportunity for other types of investigative techniques, strategies, and tools, or even the need to utilize those. So from your perspective, are you seeing more companies begin to understand the need for data and data analytics from the investigative perspective, in addition to some of the other perspectives, or are, are lawyers still pretty much lost on that topic? <laughs> well, I I do think that there are many lawyers that that will always be lost in that topic. It's um, you know it's it's hard, um, but I do see a shift, albeit slow shift, uh, to more emphasis on data uh, in in investigations and less reliance just on interviews of people. Um, now, the, you'll, you'll never um, ob, uh, eliminate the need uh, for good interviewing techniques and skills, but, you know, having the data, there's nothing like it. And being able to um, draw upon employees actions which if they're working remotely almost all of their actions are going to be recorded uh remotely and recorded uh through the use of computer um you know you've got a lot more data to work with so i think that that you're gonna see and you are we are seeing a lot more emphasis on data collection um Dinosaurs like myself, who are not uh, data analytics experts, um, are going to find ourselves, I think, replaced by a new generation of fraud examiners and investigators that are well-trained and are getting more well-trained every day in using data analytics and remote techniques uh, to detect and prevent fraud. Eric, um, first of all, uh, thanks again for coming on the podcast. And I wanted to ask that perhaps as we move into Q3 and Q4 and even 2021, um, that I might be able to call upon you for another retrospective of where we might be in those times of coronavirus. I'd love to participate. Thanks, Tom. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox again. I'd like to thank you for listening to this episode of Compliance and Coronavirus. This is the only B2B podcast which brings clear and sane information for both the compliance professional and a business executive. If I could ask you uh, to do one thing, if you could tell one person about this podcast, I'm trying to get the word out uh, about this most unique podcast in the compliance podcast network so if you could tell one person about it send them a copy send them a link do something uh, to help me publicize this podcast i would greatly appreciate it compliance and coronavirus is a production of the compliance podcast network and it appears tuesday wednesday and thursday of each week thanks again for listening and i hope you'll join me again for another episode